All right, greetings in the name of the Most High. Uh, we're going to have a, a very uh, interesting show today. We're going to talk about uh, gang stalking and uh, harassment and bullying and just in all the strange things that go on with uh, my guest today. And, and it's fun to have her here, Tina Plackinger. Uh, hi, Tina. How are you? Greetings, Tina. Hi, Zeph. It's nice to be here today. Thank you. Yeah, th- it goes back and forth between this kind of poor connection with uh, with this um, Skype call. I don't know why that is. I, I've, uh, y- you know, it's it's just one of the more bizarre things that happens, but it's because we're talking, and apparently when we're talking, things happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. anyway. Well, so- you know, we're dealing with the prince the prince of the power of the air and so i'm on an internet phone so we're we're dealing with that over here too right but we plead the blood of jesus over this today we, we ple- and it'll be okay like yeah. you said amen and i double that plead the blood of jesus on this transmission on this uh, call and that it may bless uh, many of you out there coping with fear the fear to go outside the fear to get involved the fear to go because there's been harassment and then eventually they they get you to uh cower they get you to uh hide away they get you to dodge their punches they get you to to change your behavior and um i'm going to ask tina right now i mean you know we've all been conditioned by this this constant onslaught of bullying and harassment over the years i mean you know it, it, it builds up this is what i'm hearing what No, no, I'm. Uh, that's not me. That's not that from this transmission. Trish is informing me that we're not hearing that the transmission is garbled. Um, that that may be, uh, but on on this end, it's not garbled, and um, it it. I have no indication that there's anything wrong at all. So she's going to check that anyway. Um, the, the bullying harassment it it you know it's a theme that we've had lately how it builds up that's what are you talking about well you keep cutting out okay so we're not able to do the broadcast today i don't have a connection anymore well let's keep i don't have a connection on skype but if there's no transmission it it's i get you know i I guess there's, she's hearing some kind of chirping coming out of the other side on, 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 in the chat room uh, on this broadcast. Um, we keep getting a low bandwidth signal on the Skype call. Um, we don't get this on 20 on 20. We don't get this. The last time we had this, these issues were, was when, when I was talking to Tina last time. And, um, you know, uh-huh. it's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary. It, it really is. Are we all right? Okay, Trish says we're okay. So she's our engineer okay. today. So she says we're okay. We're going to go forward. So Tina, welcome to the all show. Right. And okay. and uh, Thanks, Trish. I understand that your your video today was uh, based on you know summoning the courage to you know basically my courage comes from the Lord. I just got to follow Him, keep my eyes on Him, and the heck with the rest of it, right? I mean, but but what are your what are your thoughts on overcoming those fears and and being able to to function and contribute and, and, and be a person. What do you think? I think it's uh, podcasts like yours that really help us do that. Um, you know, you were talking about that yesterday on your podcast about trauma and, uh, you know, do, doing uh, do-arounds and trying to get, uh, you know, try to uh, make our life, you know, take a detour around things that trigger us and then continue on with the things that we want to do and try to find some kind of pleasure uh, in that. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's those kinds of things that help us go through that. If, you know, you're, what you talked about yesterday was just phenomenal to me because um, 
<sighs> I don't know if we can really get past stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of us are so badly damaged. I, I even find people who they befriend me, and then as soon as they know how uh, we're messed with on the emails and stuff like that, they get scared and then they drop away. But see, that's exactly what the enemy wants. He doesn't want any of us to communicate. Yeah, there are. Um, another person t- told me that they became a friend on Twitter, and then they said they lost all their friends <laughs> because for whatever reason. And they like, well, now you're my only friend. I mean, you know, and it's like, yeah, but I'm not doing anything. I mean, I'm just, I'm here trying to move forward and trying to yeah. put the past. And the past for me just goes way back to childhood with all this, this. Uh, horrible stuff and um so it's a lot of years of you know build up but i tell you that in especially today like praying you know ephesians 6 uh spiritual warfare prayer and and you know aligning with the word of god and going forward because you know it's it's funny how the children of god are the one you know being afflicted and persecuted but many don't know how to handle it and i i had a problem yesterday i was having trouble and uh so I just, the only thing I can tell you, I think, you know, for me that works is just really giving everything to the Lord and understanding that Jesus said it best. He said, look, because they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Because they hated me, they're going to hate you. And they hated me without cause. That nobody I know mean any harm to anybody, especially Tina here, you know, and, and her history, we're going to go through that in a minute, just... Being out in LA and being a people person, being in the in the in the uh, bodybuilding industry and and uh, television and film and and then how it all came to a, an abrupt halt. Um, but she didn't mean harm to anybody and and uh, did not deserve what happened to her. Maybe we can just go over that again. I mean, you know, it's just fascinating the story of how you were functioning out there, living in North Hollywood, and just having your life, and then one day. One day, it all changed, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, somebody had made a video uh, and said that I uh, was uh, uh, bodybuilding did this did this to me. Bodybuilding did not do this to me. Right. Um, everything was okay with that. Um, I had retired from the stage um, and and doing exhibitions and stuff like that. I was doing a little writing on the side, but. Uh, I was taking care of my then husband who I was married to who was uh, sick and he was dying. And so I was really out of the scene. And then after he passed away, uh, I went out uh, with the wrong person. And I made mm-hmm. someone very angry who had nothing to do with bodybuilding at all, you know, had more to do with uh, street games and that sort of thing. So wow. I was really out of my element then. Um and and that that's what happened. Um, but you know, you, you and I, what you had said about you know forgetting our past and um, all of that. Today, my my podcast is on remembering who we are. You know, not mm-hmm. just me because I was a pro athlete, but you know, there's so many people that they want to hear my story. They want to hear yeah. the things that I go through, and uh, they start telling me all about their stuff. And you know, these are people who are really smart. I mean, some of them have raised families. Some of them have gone to college. Some of them have, um, you know, they're, they're artists. I mean, they've done fantastic things in their life. There's one film director that I know who is, uh, you know, living out of shelters right now. You know, they did that to him in California. And, no. you know, it's, it's like, you know, we can't really forget who we are because that's why they came after us in the first place. And we really don't want to forget those special qualities that God gave us. Do you agree? That's interesting. Yeah, they, they, yeah, because a lot of times, you know, when I was younger, I just cursed myself because I wanted I wanted to be acceptable and not different. I guess, and I, I thought I was being picked on because I was different, maybe, and I couldn't, but I couldn't tell in what way, and so I just, you know, cursed my birth because I, you know, I. I was tired of being mocked and ridiculed and, you know, bullied and attacked and followed and, and all the weird stuff, the demonic, you know, one guy starts a conversation 
Another guy miles away finishes it, and there's no connection between the two. That sort of thing scared the crap out of me, you know. <laughs> and and sure. uh, you, you know, because I wasn't used to that. I mean, that, I especially got that as a teenager. And um, and I just I just cursed my mother's womb in a way like Jeremiah did, you know. And Jeremiah's and that's in Jeremiah twenty. He curses his mother's womb, and and the reason is because he says he's tired of being mocked for no reason. So if you want to see somebody that's gone through the same thing, look at Jeremiah. He's a good example of somebody that means nobody any harm at all. They want to hear from him when they want to hear from him. Then they then they th- then they'll throw him in a cage. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's been this weird relationship from the very beginning, and I think it's it's kind of like an instinct thing. I think it's like they sense we're not the same. Maybe we're different. I tried to find out how we're different. And I tried to find, I, th- I thought, I, l- I researched the bloodlines. I thought, well, maybe it's got something to do with RH negative. Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, it goes across, across bloodline, bloodlines, if you will. RH negative, RH positive, it doesn't matter. So, so that's not a factor. And then I looked at other things. Um, and, you know, finally, when I just gave my life over to the Lord, I mean, I just, I got to a point where it just seems like everything I try to do, they sabotage. And what's the use? And uh, so I gave my life over to the Lord. I mean, later in life, you'd think I would have gotten the message, but I and then and then it all made sense because the Lord said, "Yeah, you know, you got to get over a lot of this damage. There's damage, but yeah, this is the deal." And y- you know, y- you people are are you know you're you're my people, and I'm like, we're your people. We're beat to crap. We're beat the the you know the living you know daylights out of us, and. And he goes, I, but I'll, I'll restore you. He says, I'll restore you in his word. And I'm like, you know, and I, I talked to this one guy, uh, Bishop Kankel, so many years ago. He had a lot of insight into things. And um, I said, well, I feel like people stole my talent. I had talents, especially like when I was a teenager, I had all kinds of talents, you know. And I feel like people, there were people that stole them. He goes, yes, but the Lord restores, he said. Nothing is stolen forever. If it's yours, it's yours. It will come back. They only think they stole it. And that's that's spiritual warfare, but that also goes along with the gang stalking because the same people that do that, i.e. sorcery, witchcraft, and all that, and they're throwing all that on you, are the same people that line up as a group in a hive and stalk people. I mean, I've I've been invited to like, I just remember this party I was invited to and seemed the whole purpose of it was to humiliate me. That whole purpose, mm-hmm. and then when I finally broke down, I started crying because I just was overwhelmed with trauma from not just that m- incident, but before I was, I was a teenager at the time. I guess I, I just um, didn't have a step up or lift that night. I just had had enough, and then I had to uh, flee and and and, and uh, alone, and uh, I, I put it out of my mind because it was so traumatic. I couldn't think. I, I felt like Carrie, and you know, in. Uh, uh, you know the, the the film carrot. You know the, the the pig blood. I felt it was like like a setup like that, and they were all fi- high fiving each mm-hmm. other. When I got upset, they were all high fiving each other, going, "Yeah, good job, bro." Mm-hmm. I'm like, "What? Where? How, what is the justification? What what happened there that would cause people to do such things?" And uh, I never I never got an answer. I put it out of my mind for thirty years that that incident. Because uh, I just couldn't believe people would coordinate uh, behind the scenes to create a some kind of superficial, artificial party or something where a kid goes and he's humiliated to the point of suicide, and and then they high five each other as you're killing yourself. I mean, you know, knowing that now you're going to go kill yourself, awesome, you know, high five all around, guys, great job. But w- w- what is that? And these are all entertainment people. I mean, you know, fam- children of entertainers and. You know, they're all Hollywood people, you know, Hollywood, you know, Hollywood royalty people, some of them. And, um, and how they, how they reveled in, in, uh, a defeat, at, uh, which I didn't know there was a contest. I didn't know there was some kind of us versus them going on. And, and, and because I couldn't figure it out. And for so many years, I told, I told my shrink about it, you know, or shrinks. I had many shrinks <laughs> trying to understand that. And they go, well, you're delusional. That never happened. Oh, and then, yeah. so I was discredited from ever talking about it again and shamed 
so that I would never raise my voice again about what happened. And so that, that kind of thing, repeated over and over again, uh, caused me to be very confused and, and afraid of, of people in the outdoors and th- that they're going to get me. So I've had to live with that. And people are, well, you haven't had a normal life. I go, you're damn right I haven't had a normal. That's the whole point of this podcast. There hasn't been a normal life. Anyway, I'm hogging the show. Tina, you chime in here. You can relate, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, wow. Well, you know, my my things like, you know, going to a party and then having them say something to me that was a very dramatic, uh, traumatic experience maybe that happened at the last place where I lived or the mm-hmm. last state that I lived. That happened to me about six years ago. I was invited to a, a, a barbecue uh, maybe seven years ago, and uh, I, I believe it was just so that the community could show up and they could point me out, you know. But when I got wow. there, it was uh, different. And then when I got myself real comfortable and they saw that I was comfortable and I was, you know, okay, uh, someone came over and said something to me that, well, you know, nobody would have known. Uh, you know, I had ran from danger uh, out of uh, Long Beach, California at mm-hmm. one point. And right. so nobody knew that. Okay. And uh, I'm in the woods with all these new people that I don't know, and they, they wouldn't know that, but somebody sure enough came up and said something to me. Yeah, and that triggered me, and that just put me in a tailspin, and I, you know, left. I had to come home. Uh, you know, those things happened to me as an adult. You know, I can't imagine going through these things as a child. I mean, there was child abuse in my family. My father was very, uh, um, my dad was very violent. He didn't drink or do drugs. I probably wish he would have. Maybe that would have helped. But he <laughs> was a workaholic, and he was he was violent, and he very strict with us. You know, he was Sicilian. So he would be a good dad, good provider, all that, but he just, you know, I mean, we, we shook when we entered the house. We never knew what to expect. Um, so that had a lot to do, and you, know, you and you talk about you know there's there's a lot of a lot of his targets have been abused as children. That is so bizarre to right, me, but right. it is true. Yeah, that's um, that's a very but, in- interesting point about the tie-in between abuse as a child and then later on as an adult experiencing this phenomenon called gang stalking. Later on, you, you know, maybe even after a period, a, dor- a dormant period. And then all of a sudden it flares up again and brings back those abuse issues. Mm-hmm. See, and that's what makes me really think it's, it's really spiritual. I mean, you know, I mean, sure, they get your profile and they go through all of that. But, you know, how could so many targets also have had, you know, violence or they grew up with an alcoholic parent? And that's a whole issue in itself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, stuff like that. I mean, you know, we do have our past, but... I think I've been able to survive this because surviving my dad as a child right. really strengthened me. I mean, I, I I learned at a young age how to bob and weave. You know, I, I learned at a young age how to... Uh, I, 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 I knew Jesus. I don't know. I came into this world knowing Jesus. He was like my, my sidekick. Well, when I was a kid, Jesus was always there with me. So that was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, my dad taught me a lot about Jesus, God bless him. And I just always knew Jesus. And, and Jesus is the ticket. You know, I'm not, you know, a, here, here. a huge Bible thumper. I go to the Bible. I love my scriptures. I say them. Uh, I have run from danger. I have, uh, you know... The name of Jesus is a strong tower. I run into it, and I am safe, you know, hollering these scriptures as I'm, you know, fleeing some disastrous situation. Um, But, um, you know, the bottom line is, even if you don't know a whole lot of Bible, just to have this relationship with Jesus, because he does does come when you call him. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know how. I, I wouldn't have... I guess the Lord is my strength, you know, as the Bible says. I, I, so many of these scriptures turn out to be so, so direct hit true, you know, like the Lord is my strength and my, um, you know, like Psalm 91 and Psalm 23 and and about, you know, the, the Bible calls in Proverbs 1, it's interesting, the, the 
Bible calls these people this collective, this hive mind collective, which all the gang stalking comes from a, I think people would admit, a hive mind or a collective, a group, right? Called That's why it's called gang stalking, not single stalking. It's a group, mm-hmm. usually. And um, the Bible describes mm-hmm. them in Proverbs 1 as th- they say, don't tie in with the sinners, the collective, the a collective of sinners, because they lay wait for innocent blood to slay the innocent and take what they have in a collective purse. Now that gives us a clue. A lot of people say that's communism. No, that's well, I mean, communism is a manifestation of the gang stalking and of Satanism and of all that. But I'm just saying that th- this idea is it's a collective. And what they're trying to do is while they're, you know, or at least many of the people I know, and uh, I don't know everybody, but I know quite a few who say that, you know, the, the motive just seemed to be they were trying to get my house. That's the latest one from a friend. They're trying to get my house, so they're trying to make me look crazy so that they want to throw me in the yeah. me- mental hospital so they can, so the cops can take my house. So that's the latest one. I, that's like a week and a half old, okay, of, of a guy that's really uh, struggling right now. And my prayers are with him. Yep. And, and so he said, you know, there's, there's a motive. But I said, but I, I asked him, I said, well, but it is a group of people, right? He goes, oh, yeah. It's the neighbor next door, and I might kill him, he says. And I said, well, don't do that. But see, sometimes that kind of thing happens. Uh, they, he said, they've thoroughly yes. discredited me. They've uh, made me look crazy. And uh, they say I'm sick and that all this is I'm imagining I'm just paranoid and I'm making up the stuff that they want my house. He goes, but my house is yeah. it's, it's worth five hundred thousand dollars. I worked really hard to get to get it over all the years. And he does work hard. He works. He's a, he's actually has his own business as a laborer. He's not, you know, a, a white collar pushing a pencil somewhere. <laughs> He works really hard, okay? So he says, my house is worth $500, and they want it, and that's why all this is happening. And they said they were tracking me by my phone, so I threw my phone away. That's why I couldn't get in touch with them. And um, so he was, like, on the run, and, 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 he, and he, he's in that, on yep. the run, and he's trying to keep his house, but they're, they're after him, and, and he, he's completely in the right, and they're completely, and they're doing what they're doing, that gang thing, you know what I mean? That revenue farming yep. that, that, uh, police agencies sometimes do. And, and a lot of times this, this revolves around drugs, but in this case, it doesn't. And, uh, I, I told him, I said, well, look, go, you know, I, I, I don't know him that well. But I said, look up on the internet gang stalking and revenue farming and take a look at, look at some of those posts and videos and see if that might help to clarify, you know, what's going on, right? And I just pray that he gets some help. I, he need, the help he needs right now is, 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 is spiritual. It's supernatural help to get through this period where they're just, uh, again, do they have a money motive? Well, of course they do. But is it spiritual too? Yes, because people that would do something like that are spiritually on the dark side. And they tend to collectivize together and they all get the same demon and that's why they can hear, like, they say, oh, that's uh, Zeph and uh, he, the, uh, oh, his daughter is dead. So a perfect stranger that doesn't know me off the Internet or anything else might say, uh, you know, and, and you're next, Zeph. We got your daughter. Now, uh-huh. we're, you right. know, I've had that already, you know, and, and then we're going to get you. So, you know, taking credit for, you know, that sort of thing is completely demonic. Now, I just dismiss that with a, a prayer of not just rebuke, but I bind that and cast that out in Jesus' name. And I, you know, pray, plead the blood of Jesus on this transmission and a hedge of protection around all of us listening to this today, or those of you who tune in in the future, that you be protected because we plead the blood of Jesus, which is the remedy for all this crap. But Amen. a lot of these people get thrown in the deep end of the pool un- and they're not prepared for it. It just like with this guy, it just comes on. He doesn't even know what it's called. He didn't even know it's called gang stalking. He didn't know anything. He was just he was a newbie at it. So wow. <laughs> yeah. know, and that's a lot to deal with. Yeah, mm-hmm. he just can't believe it. He he's like, well, I've been working my whole life, and uh, all of a sudden this is going on, and I I don't get it. So it's um. You know, and I think the same thing happened to you, Tina, out in uh, North Hollywood. I think you were going along, 
having what would be called pretty much a normal life. And then all of a sudden, you know, whether you ticked off the wrong person or whatever, there's a lot of people participating in, in your, you know, with, in your demise, especially in Long Beach. Well, they, they got me down to Long Beach. I lived in Woodland Hills. First, okay. I was in North Hollywood for like 20 years. Mm-hmm. And then uh, that's where the homelessness happened in, in North Hollywood. Uh, I was uh, right there uh, uh, off of Laurel Canyon and, and Magnolia. Mm-hmm. And I was there in a, in a great, wonderful, rent-controlled, uh, beautiful, huge apartment. was there for a long time. And uh, that's when it happened. And, you know, everybody turns on you at one time. Uh, the manager starts complaining that uh, you're letting your dog <clears throat> lift his leg by his door. Well, yeah, that's like one foot higher than my dog could even reach. That's a, you know, Are you kidding me? You know, just lies, problems, things start coming up, uh, you know, and then there's a the little spat between, you know, the tenant and the landlord. Uh, and, and it goes on and on from there. The cops show up, you know, uh, well, we have a, a, a complaint by the neighbor that you're making a lot of noise over here. How can I be making a lot of noise? I live alone. You know, I don't even have music on. What are you, what are you talking about? And it just, the harassment starts, and it just builds from there. I've, I get a lot of emails from people who are homeless or they're on the brink of being homeless. They try to get us homeless. And I was for one time, not literally on the streets. I had my vehicle, and then I had uh, trailers and motorhomes and blah, 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 blah. They would get uh, impounded uh, because the cops are in on it. So you're constantly fighting to keep your stuff. And um, it, it's, it's a very, very hard life. To begin with, but when you're homeless, it's this is where they want you. Why do you suppose they want you there? I think you're more easily controlled. Uh, maybe uh, it because you know, there you have no income. Basically, uh, I get an email from a guy. He's a film director. He did a lot of good stuff, and. Mm-hmm. Um, he spends his days walking to the bus, getting off the bus, standing in line, putting in his name to hopefully get a bed that night at the shelter. And then uh, hopefully he's called then. I mean, he's got to get back on the bus to go somewhere else so that he can get a meal and maybe take a shower mm-hmm. and then go back on the bus and, and, and walk to that line where he was to see if he made the second list. The second list then is that, you know, okay, you might get a bed tonight. But if you don't get a bed, then uh, you can't sleep outside now because there's a law that if you're homeless and you're sleeping outside, you're trespassing. Yeah. So he has to stay awake all night, trying to stay awake all night. You know, and that kind of stuff. You know what? I I had a little trailer and a little motorhome that I was on the streets, and I was bebopping around down there in Long Beach and, I was sort of controlled within an eight-mile uh, radius. But I wasn't like that in the shelters and stuff. You know, that it's hard. And he it's fell, hard. He, he and fell a, long, it, a long way. It, it destroys you faster. It destroys you faster. Yeah, see, I think that's the motive, is the destruction and an elimination and death of that person. That There's no other motive. I think that, you know, to me, I've, I've thought about it a long time. I think they get power off the degradation as you're going down. They get power out of the desperation. But then ultimately it's the sacrifice, the, the death that they really cash in on. You know, in the spiritual realm, I mean, in a spiritual way. Uh, feeding off yes. death, feeding off trauma, feeding off negativity, feeding off hurting other people. I mean, that's what they, they're, they're into. And that's what our society, unfortunately, is, is uh, that's the, the deep dark secret that people don't want to address. They want to see a, you know, they want to go with the mind control, which, you know, this is an equanimous uh, or, you know, a, a society based on, you know, equal justice under the law and equality and, you know, the good with the bad and, you know, and, and stay positive and, you know, but when people get a different perspective, they go, well, it's, it's like 100% negative, <laughs> and, but, but the regular people in society can't see it until it happens to them, right? So um, I, I worry about the homelessness in L.A. because I've, I, I remember the before the 1984 Olympics. Remember that in 84, the L.A. Olympics? 
And um, it seemed like leading up to that. I was actually on the. I was on the streets then, so I was out of the mix. I didn't know what was going on, but I, I do know of it. Yes. Well, at that time in 1983, it seemed like you know there was a lot of homeless down on Skid Row, and in you know on the way to the Coliseum and other areas where they're going to have uh, the the Olympics. And all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, by like 1984, but before the summer, it seemed like the homeless were all gone. Mm-hmm. There was a period there. Yeah, and and people thought yeah. they were rounded out and taken out to like Cabazon and, and shot to death. Uh, you know, I mean, but that was just a rumor, you know. Uh, but people wondered and they went, well, I'm, I'm one of the last people to wonder, but I'm wondering even down to this day. Uh, did they round them up and murder them? We heard about the same thing in Washington D.C. that happened. All of a sudden, they they were gone from Washington D.C. It's like, well, what? How did they do that? You know, they suddenly want to clean the city up. Did they? Did they round them up? You you, you wonder. And then, of course, when I did some ministry where we're feeding the homeless, it seemed like every one of them they didn't want to come in to be registered for rehabilitation. They stayed out in the you know trenches and out in the you know cracks and the crevices, and they'd come in for the meal, but then they'd split before they had to sign their name on anything. And uh, and I asked them, well, why? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, we had that delay in the phone. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and and you wonder why? Uh, it's probably because they felt safer. They weren't under anybody's control. I don't blame them. I Me don't neither. blame them. Yeah. I, I think I would have. I recommend that because you know. So it seems like when when one of them comes in for rehab and then they try to make a story out of it, and you see him driving a forklift and having his hair cut and then having a wife and some kids, and like, wow, here's a pillar of society. He was homeless, but look, he's been restored. You wonder. You know what called the dogs off? You know you wonder what what happened there, and uh, y- y- you know, and most of these homeless guys, they're not fooled. They don't they don't believe any of that for a minute. <laughs> you know, so they they're going to stay out there, right? And uh, th- this guy that and they're some very smart people. They're very smart people, really. Have to be. Yeah, you have to be. You have to learn. Mm-hmm, have to be. Right. Have to be. Right. And. and uh, so, so it's, it's, it was just a, at one point I had even written a story about, I had met these, I guess you'd call them jet set artists from Venice and also downtown LA that would do these big public installations at airports and they'd work with things like acrylic and different, you know, they're just, uh, you know, I'm not an art, I'm not a, a visual, you know, an artist like that. So I was just like a friend of somebody that it was in that group. And so I would tagging along. Uh, you know, why? I don't know. But, uh, you know, you know I, I asked this guy that was working with the acrylic, well, if you could put a, you know, a person in there, you could like put people in the acrylic and then have that as a display. And I, I wrote that up as some kind of a story because I thought that would be very interesting if you had these artworks all over the world filled with homeless people. You know, you abduct them off the street and you put them in an, in an, in an art form and, you know, you install it at a big office building or, you know, at the downtown center or whatever. And, and eventually people realize that all the, the reason we don't have a homeless problem is because all the artists took the homeless people and put them in their installations. And it was kind of a funny idea. But uh, I got that idea right about that time. Uh, that wow. I, that I, What sparked the idea was I wondered what happened to the homeless. And when I went downtown to this guy's loft, I was wondering, well, why... He said, there used to be all the homeless right down there, you know, looking out the window. I said, well, what happened to them? He goes, nobody knows. They just disappeared. Yeah. So, you know, it makes you, makes you wonder, you know, and that was, that was before. I guess at that point I had some acceptability because I didn't, I was living in an alternative universe. I had forgotten everything that had happened to me and I was being handled by people and being programmed and, I guess I was being cooperative at that point. But the minute I started waking up, they started in again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the minute I started rebelling, they started in again. The minute I started thinking my own thoughts, they started in again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's the weirdest thing. I just wish, Tina, that I could almost get 
Go behind the curtain and see what's back there. Where the hell is this coming from? How come it's so organized? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I, and you said that they were after you, you know, when you were a kid and, yep. and, and all that. Um, I, didn't sit, I didn't sit at the cool kids' table either. Mm-hmm. I was uh, just disliked. I don't know. I, I didn't have a lot of friends in school and that kind of thing. I just mm-hmm. didn't. And um, so, that, okay, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, is being set apart like that and, you know, what is behind that curtain, you know, why. And, and again, I think it's because of, like, the, 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 the podcast that came to me this morning about don't forget, you know, who, who you are. Yeah, yeah. Don't forget where you come from. You know, I mean, some of us are in our 60s, so, you know, we've got to go back like 40 years and think, you know, wow, what did I do back then? What, you know, where was I? How was I? Uh, Boy, I was a real shaker and a mover. I mean, people were like, okay, now, Tina, what what are you doing now? Because I had such a passion for life. I just, you know, tried anything. And, um, yeah. And I think that it's those independent people, you know, surviving, being homeless and surviving, um, you know, you've got to be an independent thinker. You, you've got to be strong. And it's very interesting how these people that write me, they, they're very smart and even educated and everything is gone. You know, the witchcraft and, and wipe the guy out. Now there he is or whatever, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I think it's our independent thinkers. We're independent thinkers. Could I be right? Somebody yeah. threw that at me one day, and I thought it did pretty good. Yeah, no, I, I, I've, I've thought the same thing. You, you're thinking outside the box. You didn't. You're not hypnotizable. Perhaps you're not buying the Kool Aid. You watch TV, and they're all hypnotized, but you're not. You're just set apart, different. And it's just that simple. There's no other reason. It just, you know, you can layer on more reasons, like you've got something of value they want to steal or something. But it all comes down to that you know the really the cost of being different and then of course later when you figure out that jesus was the ultimate different one you follow jesus now it's the cost of being a disciple of jesus it's it there's a cost there too and and uh uh, it seems that uh you know especially now as i look back on the world and the world situation and i see who's and, and I see people, you know, that are following Jesus and making their way in the world and doing doing okay, you know. But I also realize that you go through a transformation where, you know, a lot of people that you did rely on, you know, they suddenly become enemies. They, they're they no longer your friends. Uh, and the more you tap, I, I mean, I, I had this immediately with people that I was involved in, in, in the film uh, business with where they, like in one day, they... They just got so mad, it looked like they just wanted to kill me because of Jesus. And I remember having coffee with this one guy, and he was a cinematographer, and it was like, he just was pretty much almost spitting on me. I'm like, my God, I didn't, I don't see how my following Jesus is really going to, why are you so offended? Because before I was just, when he knew me and when we were working together, I was just a lost guy. And he was fine with that. But the minute Jesus came in, all of a sudden, you know, I, I'm the worst thing that ever lived. <laughs> you know, so uh, obviously yeah. he, he has a satanic spirit, and he's offended by mm-hmm. Jesus, and th- and that actually gave me a clue. Like, hey, Trish, and Trish was there too with me, so she's a witness to this. And I thought, you know, I think Trish, we're on the right track here, <laughs> because look at that reaction. The guy went nuts. He went hysterical. That's not normal. Mm-hmm. You know, he went hysterical. And so it's like, okay, well then, Lord, you're showing us that, y- you know, your word coming to life. You know, and, 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 you know, there's no going back because, you know, like they say, once you're, you know, once you're identified, that's the end of it. If they identify you as a child of the living God, it, I like to say it's the living, children of the living God versus the ignorant worlders, you know, <laughs> in an epic battle. It's like you got the Satanists, you got the worlders, you got the people that just serve that side of thing. Then you have the people called out by Jesus who are all targeted. And they, and you know, they're the, mm-hmm. the early targeted individuals. Would, and you'd have to say that the Old Testament prophets were also targeted. 
And there's no other explanation for Jeremiah that he was so upset with the mocking and the and the you know people say well you should be you know bucks up be be more courageous with the mocking not be so offended i just got to go back to jeremiah and say well he was very he tried his best but he was just offended he was upset with it he said why are they mocking me i'm trying to help them i don't get it you know and 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 it it it's you can't go at it with that kind of logic. You have to go at it more like, okay, it is what it is. And they're just offended by the gospel. They're offended by it. It doesn't matter how politically correct you are even. It doesn't matter how nice you are. It doesn't matter how charitable you are. It doesn't matter how patient you are with people, how helpful. It's just a problem. And it's so supernatural. Right. It, it, it's so supernatural. It's so bizarre. Because, again, you didn't do anything to warrant any attacks that and you're trying to be helpful and then they're killing you while you're helping them and it's just jesus man it's it it when you get into that zone of jesus then you know you're all right because you're you're in good company you're in good company exactly yeah. you got tina here yeah you, you, you got a friend here with <laughs> tina and she she'll you people email her and, and right you answer the emails right to the best you can when they when they email in, I do almost every one. Yep, I do. Um, yeah, you know, I, yeah, on another level, you know, of this craziness, because I've been to uh, churches where uh, you know, and I was tithing, tithing, uh, and this was one church after the other after the other. It didn't matter what denomination the church was; it mm-hmm. didn't matter. They would eventually want me out of there, and I think. Somebody had gave him, given me this idea that, you know, these large organizations that follow the false light, okay, they'll wear, wear a crucifix around her neck, but they follow a false light and they move up in degrees and do weird rituals and weird things to do oaths and go up in degrees, okay. If these pillars are running the community, they have a lot of power, and if you're a preacher at a church, you don't want your church taken away. And if they just go to that person and say, hey, we don't want so-and-so in your church, you know, stop being so friendly, I mean, or we're going to, you know, take, you know, t- you know, pull your rug out from underneath you, I, and, and so the pastor will do that. Um, I, you know, and I, it was pastor after pastor after pastor, it didn't matter what church I was in or what state I was in, uh, or priest. They would all eventually want me out of there. And I do think that there is something that is running the show that these people listen to. And, and I could be out there to lunch, but I, that's what I think is going on. I, I think that there's uh, uh, an organization of some kind that, that seems to be coming up a lot in topic these days with people that could be the pillars of the communities. And they're behind the scenes running the show. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what I think. Like a few people. I that, mean, in, in the courthouse, go ahead. at the banks, uh, everywhere where there's power. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, yeah, they're taking their orders from, uh, you know, from a, a certain spirit, really. Headquarters. But, yeah, but they're taking their, 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 their marching orders from headquarters. And that's why they're all so similar in the way they behave toward you because they're all getting the same orders from the same source. Correct. And you know, Correct. They all, and they now also- if I had a if I had a family and a business, and somebody came to me and said, "You know, we're going to take your business away, where I can't feed my children." I mean, because there's no punches held back here. Or, uh, you know, you, you better do this or uh, this this will happen. I, mean, I, I would be really up against a, a, a hard place on a rock. And it wouldn't matter if that person uh, tithed, smiled, was nice to me. I would probably cry, which I've seen people do. Mean things to me while they're crying. Once again, please. They did what? I have... I have seen people do mean things to me while they're crying. That's just... Almost as though they've had to make a choice, you know? Uh, I have to do this to this person, otherwise uh, these people over here are going to do this to me and my family, and I can't have it. 
I, I really think it comes down to the bullying. It's a big organization of bullying. I'm absolutely there with you. I've I've uh, had similar, but I mean, crying while while doing a bad thing to you. They don't want to do it, but they've got to, or their family goes down. I've seen that over and over and over again. And rather than just standing with you, you know, say like, I'm, hey, I'm a brother in Christ too. I'm going to stand with you. You know, it's like, I'm a brother in Christ too. What's wrong with you, Tina? You know, I'm, I mean, what's wrong with you, Zev? We're, I'm a brother in Christ and uh, I have to hurt you. I'm like, well, then you're not really a brother in Christ, are you? Answer, no. Correct. Not really. Well, then how do you feel about your salvation, buddy? You're not saved. You're not with Christ. Yeah. Your pastor's an idiot. Your entire life is delusion. How do you feel? You're the one that's in trouble, not me. Right? I mean, I, I, well, how many people I'd love to have said that to, and I didn't because I was beleaguered and, you know, t- under assault, and I, I, did, I, I didn't have those clear words like that. <laughs> and as a mother, I would never want to be in that. I'm sorry. Go, no, go I would ahead. never want to be in that position. You know, I'm a follower of Christ. I go to a church. I'm a pastor. And yet I'm put between a hard place and a rock. Here comes someone new <laughs> right. who's totally, you know, not even from this area. And I can't accept this sister or this brother. Otherwise, this is what's going to happen to me. And how am I going to feed my kids? I really do. I think it, uh, some of this boils down to that level of bullying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had so many people, and I, and I get so disturbed when people see me coming, and they either scurry away, or they look like a ton of bricks is on their shoulders, mm-hmm. and they look really sad. I had a lady behind me one day in church, at a church service. This was back a few years ago when I was going to church, and uh, she was crying. And I turned around, and I thought maybe something was going on. The Holy Spirit was doing something or whatever. It was a very animated-type church uh, service. And uh, she walked up to me afterwards, and she said, You're so pretty. She said, But you're so pretty, like that. She said, Out of the clear blue, but you're so wow, pretty. But, and she yeah. was, that made me so uncomfortable. I mean, I, 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 I wanted to run, run away. But mm-hmm. you're so pretty. My goodness, that tells uh, volumes. Volumes that she's mm-hmm. been listening to, to people telling her to attack you. And, mm-hmm. and she doesn't want to because you're so yeah. pretty. You're, you're so pretty and I, I feel so guilty. Yeah. In yes. church. It, it was very disturbing to me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's beyond Rose. And then she baby. never acted like that again. She never acted like that again then. She just, you know, it was like, okay, that one time, that was that personality that came out of her, and now she's somebody different. So, but, right. In other know, words, that, carry on. that demon came out and said something to you, and then she, they made sure it was buttoned up in her so that it would never happen again. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, uh, they, yeah, they, they, if they reveal too much, then they get in trouble. Mm-hmm. So there's, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's, it, it's, I, I, you know, and you wonder, well, then what is the purpose of this world then? Why is this world yeah. here if it's going to be just this contest between the slaves of Satan acting like they're the Christians and people that have been traumatized and therefore maybe not acting at their best because of uh, pain foisted on them by others at, through no fault of their own? No fault of their own whatsoever. And, um, and, and, you know, they don't look the best. And so, therefore, they're the bad guy. The people that are the bad guy, the evil ones, who are acting on behalf of these institutions run by demons, they're the good guys. And thus, the world is backwards, a horrible place to bring in children, a horrible place to bring in any kind of human being for I mean, whatever reason. Uh, not take the good with the bad. Not, not you know... Uh, you, 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 you know, a 50, 50 light versus dark, but 90% dark and about, you know, 10, the 10% that's a ray of hope is Jesus. And that's what's revealed to us. And then you wonder why, Lord, are you doing that? And then the Lord says, and then I have to do this. The Lord says, don't worry. I've got this. And so then I feel at that point of going into the word, I feel at peace. 
when I know that God's got this, he's asking me to suffer, you know, in the sense of when I say suffer, I mean, you know, not be accepted by the group or, you know, have those kinds of experiences where the unfair things happen and all that. But, but to be forgiving and loving back to them, that's Christ, uh, not being a chump, but, but understanding the whole thing and still, despite all that, being forgiving and loving anyway. Um, yeah, it, it almost seems like that's the fruit that, that kind of impossible fruit that God wants, that God is harvesting. And he's asking us to do that, to harvest that, that, uh, that precious fruit that's so counterintuitive to living, you know, because you'd think, well, the bad guys should be punished and the good guys should be, should be boosted up, right? <laughs> and not the other way, not, not the other way around. But what I hate to see, Tina, is like people like you that were, again, just going along, meaning no one did any harm, and then coming into this reality, and then the reality stays there. It, it, it's, okay, please address this. Do you, do you think that the, this reality will lift from you ever to where you can just get back to that normal life? Quote, quote. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take a leap here and say no. Yeah, I would like for it to. I've been doing this for 18 years, and I'm to the point where I don't even want to go to another church because I don't want to bring the pastor and his family problems. I actually don't have things to do with people, like calling my old gym partner from 18 years ago. I'd love to say hello to her, but I don't want to bring her any problems. And I know that that's what follows, and eventually people do things to me, and then, you know, they either are crying or they look at me mad at me because I'm there. Why aren't you out of here so that I don't have to do this to you? And they're mad at me, okay? So I've got this complex going on. Right. So I've... Yeah, so now I'm more, uh, I actually used a word yesterday, and I was going to look it up, but I didn't, but I wrote it down, that I, that I have a monastic life, okay? It, that's got to be, what you're saying is that, you know, I've, I've been taken and put aside like almost a sanctification, and people don't realize Amen. that when, they're, when they're all by themselves isolated. And they don't know that if they bless you, they'll be blessed by the living God. That's, that's how it works. If they would do the opposite, they will be blessed, not hurt. But they don't believe that. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's big. If they bless you, they are blessed. It's that simple. And they do the opposite because they're scared of being punished. So they never really walk with God, even though they all say they're the experts with God. Because... They, they, the test that they're being given, i.e. being nice to you, giving Jesus a cup of water, right? They won't yes. do it. They'll give him vinegar. Yes. They won't give him water when he needs water because, yes. because they're afraid of being punished. But if they did give him water, they would be blessed. If they did you a solid, but they're afraid. they would be blessed. If they, they got out in front of you knowing that they... Maybe they're not a lamb. Maybe you are, you know, and they, but they're a friend of the lamb, you know what I mean? Because they want favor with God. They would help you and therefore be blessed with strength to withstand anything. In fact, God will move the bad people out of the way and he will make a way for the people that would be a blessing to God's children. He makes a way where there is no way. He makes a way. He sets a table in the midst of the enemy. If they would only step out in faith and believe that they would be covered. And they fail the test and they show God and the world, the whole world, that they don't believe in Jesus. It's just a lie. They're just hypocrites. It's just a sham. The whole thing is a joke as far as they're concerned. They won't step out in faith, which is what they need to do to truly to truly put their free will where it belongs with God and thus be saved. But they won't make that effort, not even the slightest effort. Well, to answer your question, I um, 
do take that leap of faith, and I and I do hope and pray for my life to change. Uh, it would be nice. I don't think that the old lifestyle is going to come back to me. Certain people are not going to come back into my life. Things won't be the way they were. Um, but, you know, you never know. I mean, all he has to do is just blow his breath on me, and he can change my situation and turn yes. it around yes. in a second. And so I do have that faith. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't go to bed hoping I don't wake up. And I get those emails, too. I don't go to bed. Uh, not, and I used to. I used to years ago. Yeah. But see, gang stalking, the thing that gang stalking does to the targeted individuals is it pulls us away from the world and we get, and we have to rely on Jesus. We have to rely on God. And I really do believe that that's that uh, baptism under fire where we're, we're being uh, prepared. And a lot of TIs get discouraged and they go to bed asking the Lord that they won't wake up. I know. And that's not good. We get some people even on uh, the YouTube and sometimes Spreaker, not really on Spreaker so much, but uh, not really on Apple Podcasts, but on YouTube every once in a while there'll be somebody saying that the pain is so excruciating they hope they don't wake up. And then we immediately go into prayer over them. We may not write the prayer out there, but we immediately go into prayer, plead the blood of Jesus on this podcast, just like we're doing now, and just keeping that in mind, okay. that, that people would be healed and, and make that turn to realize. And, and part, of, part of that turn that you made is, is called, you, know, you mature in, in the spiritual walk. You mature in Christ. And when you mature, you realize the first thing is it's not about you. You know, <laughs> it's not about me. And when you make that turn, everything kind of clears up at that point, you know. And, and, you know, then it comes down to are you willing to suffer for Christ? And you say, well, of course I am. And then, and then it's like, okay, well, here you go. And then you're like, oh, thank you for that attitude adjustment. I needed that. You know, I didn't have the perspective right. I was thinking it was all about me and pick, being picked on and unfair, and I wanted some help, and help never came. It's all about me, 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 my suffering, my pain, my worry, my, you know, my, my, my traumas, my this, my that. And then, of course, the, the switch is it's, it, it's not yours. It's the Lord's to bear. He bears our burdens, doesn't he? That's, we put, place our burdens on him. And he fights the battles, and then we are light. We are light into a darkness, and that's that's what I believe. That's what th- this is like—a factory, and we're like God. God's like the the factory owner, you know what I mean? And he's making that commodity that I just described, that uh, that making us into light uh, into the in the darkness, and that's what he's producing. <laughs> and he needs us to go through this in order to produce that. Ultimately, yes, which is pure mm-hmm. love. It's pure. Yeah, I think it's our mindset. Yeah, mm-hmm. but talking to you, Tina, is like you know, it's almost like you know, we've talked also, you know, on the phone and stuff, and it's just like talking to another myself. You see what I mean? And I think the people out there realize, it's like we're we're in not that we're an echo chamber, but we're right in the same alignment. You, you know, in terms of understanding about everything, you know, it, and how did that happen? We didn't grow up together. We weren't, um, you know, in the same family. We weren't in the same church. We weren't in the same society or universe at all. You know, completely different uh, groups of people and different uh, stimuli, if you will, all around us. And yet we ended up being like, we could sit down at the dinner table, I'm sure, with some others and be just like a, a family dinner. And and I've had this experience yeah. with with many people, and it's un- it blows my mind. We like might meet at Starbucks or something, you know what I mean? And you know, you go well, that's enemy territory. Well, I've enjoyed being there with two or three. You're other- muffled. I'm muffled. You're a little muffled. Yeah, yeah. I'm away yeah. from. The- okay. How's this? How's this? Tina? Oh, it's so much better. Okay, so I was much I was too Thank far you. away from the yeah. So we meet in these Starbucks or coffee and, and get in talking about the end times and talking about uh, prophecy and, and, you know, all this stuff, persecution, uh, demonic warfare, all these topics. 
And sometimes we just clear the room, you know what I mean? And we'd be laughing our asses off, having a great time. But that, that circumstances would separate us. Again, like, you know, I don't see that many people because that we're all kept from each other. But when we do see them, it's, uh, it's amazing how similar the topics are and how we just flow from one thing to another in our conversation. Just like one person asks a question, the other person answers it, the next guy continues it on, the next guy adds something else that's pertinent, and we just kind of go like that. You know, it's, it's a tremendous blessing. I just know in the end of time, we'll all be together and having those conversations, and, and we're just asked to go through this desert experience now, you know, where you might see people every, you know, who knows, not too often, but what good is it if you're around people that are all going to be negative and talking negativity or very worldly and talking about things you can't even relate to? It's just like, well, why even bother getting together then? <laughs> you know, if if it's four wolves and one lamb getting together for dinner, what who, what's, what do you think's on the menu? <laughs> so anyway, uh, what are what what? So you still believe that? the Lord can change your circumstances and lighten things up. Have you felt the last few years that things have lightened at all? Or you, you, you seem to be in really good spirits. Well, I think that I was um, isolated uh, for like 15, 16 years. Mm-hmm. And I knew that there was this book project and I had asked the Lord to, you know, please, you know, if it would be okay with him, I, I would really like to have a life, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he did give me one. I, I needed to dust off the manuscript, and I needed to finish the book. Um, and from the book, I've been actually communicating with people. I mean, look at me here. I'm talking with you. I, I just, it's, you know, to me, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Um because years I talked with no one. I I didn't know that the world of gang stalking and targeted individuals had grown so much, and there are so many videos out there and podcasts and uh, so many people talking about it. It's, it's really unbelievable. And um, so he, he did change things around for me, but it wasn't... Uh, Without effort on my part, I really got on my knees and, 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 and prayed to him for a really long time, you know. Uh, you know, do something with me. Do something with me. You know, make me a prophet, a prophetess, you know, which he did not do. I didn't know what it was that he wanted me to do, you know, somewhere, and I was looking for it, and I can't find it. It's in Second Timothy, I thought, where... You know, we are soldiers. Soldiers don't go out and mingle with the world um, while they're like on active duty. Good one. Yeah, good one. And I don't, I don't have it in front of me. But if you find it, let me know. I, I, I know it's here somewhere. But um, yeah. So you know, we are soldiers for the Lord, and we don't mingle with the world. You know, we're like in battle. Um, let me see if I'm answering your question. Um, oh, no, you're fine. Just keep going. The Lord has. <laughs> Okay, the Lord has changed my life. He has uh, also changed other people's lives because of the work that he does in me. Okay, but it's not a cakewalk. You know, it it was a lot of work, and it still is. You know, I, uh, you know, made a video today, a pot, yeah, I made a video today, uh, Mm -hmm. and the the Holy Spirit was on me because I had put on an old shirt, a 35-year-old shirt that was uh, uh, one of my Tina Plackinger shirts, which, of course, I never wore, but I did sell them. 35, 40 years ago, and um, I, I got this from somebody in the family that no longer wanted it, never wore it, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of down to few threads around here, so I put it on, and, oh, that's where I got the topic of we're not supposed to forget who we are. Nice. You know, they beat you down, they sexually assault you, they drug you, they poison you, they take all your stuff, they, they have you walking around homeless in clothes that you would never even think that you'd ever be wearing. I mean, they, they do the most horrific things to you. I mean, they will, I mean, these people will, will do things to you and then watch you on closed circuit TV and, and take all your energy uh. while they watch you suffer. I mean, it's, it's so demonic what they do to us. Who even thinks about where we were 20 years ago? 
you know, when we got an award or when we got that degree from college or when our first right. one was born. Or, you know what I mean? And we people really need to remember why they don't like us. <laughs> really, <laughs> we have to remember the things. Mm -hmm. uh, this is good. This Otherwise, we forget, and they condition us, and, and we forget, and then they, what is that word? They neutralize us. They got us where they want us, then right. they break our spirit, and we can't allow that. Uh, uh, 5,000 amens to that. Um, you said closed circuit TV and I'm, I have, uh, been aware of that, uh, at, at one point in my life. And it's, it's a horrific thing to, uh, to comprehend. And in this case of some, a neighborhood sort of had us under surveillance and I didn't understand that. Could you explain about mm -hmm. when you became aware of closed circuit TV? Okay, and, and what I'm calling it may not be what it is, and it might not be closed circuit TV that I am actually talking about, right, but right. this understand. is what happened after. Okay, uh, a couple of incidences that happened. You know, one, uh, my dogs had passed away, and I had to bury them, so I was very distraught about that. And then another thing was the drugging and the uh, sexual assault, where I laid on the floor in the living room for two days in the fetal position, praying to the Lord. Okay, now the weird thing is I had direct TV and a flat screen TV, and oftentimes, and I often complained about it for like two years, why that direct TV light on that box would go on by itself. Why would it be on? There was nothing that I was recording. There was nothing that was an automatic thing. Why would it be on? And then why would people know around here what I was doing it up in the middle of the night? Or, you know, they would be saying something about, you know, you shouldn't make yourself so sick. You know, your dogs are going to die eventually. And they would should never have known that I was up at midnight upset about it and, 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 and in turmoil about it. They, they, they were watching me. So what I did, I felt that. I just, I don't know. It was just like a, this thing that just told me that this is what was going on after all these years. This is what I think is going on. So the volume on the TV uh, went out. I took the TV out of the, well, first I had changed it and I put it up, and I had it up on a swing thing. Okay. And then I had uh, this guy come in uh, and put in the, the, the this hardwood floor that I got a, a, a great deal on, the closeout thing, got in a hardwood floor put in. Well, while he was here, he was telling me that I should tip my TV and bring it down more. And I thought, well, why would he be telling me that? You know, he had said other little perpy things to me along the way. Oh. He did belong to this one church, and he was uh, the warden's right hand at one time down at the jail. So this guy was not somebody that, you know, I mean, that I didn't think was going to be somewhat perpy. But he told me to lower the TV so that, it, why? So that it's not going toward the ceiling, so that they could watch me more on the ground walking and see what I'm doing instead of it, you know, being real up high, like in the hospitals, the TVs are way up high and then they look straight out. He said, you know, you should tip it down a little bit. And I, and I never did, and then eventually I took the TV down and um, put it underneath the bed because the volume wasn't working. I was going to throw it away. I'm telling you, that afternoon, the next few days after I did that, the people, the neighbors, the people that live on this country road, they were walking past my house because they didn't know if I was in it or not. Oh, man. So they their, were all, yeah. it, their behavior changed. When I did that, their behavior changed. Then, about five days later, I left, but I came back quickly. I was going to go to the store and spend two hours, and, but I didn't. I came back quickly, and there was a white truck with two workers pulling up cables on the vacant, uh, abandoned lot next door. So something was going on. <laughs> that was close circuit TV to me. Uh, yes, uh, similar experience, um, and you know, with with the uh, with the addition of of you know people you know breaking in to the house, moving things around subtly, you know, um, um, and and that feeling of surveillance of seeing people like I take a telescope and look way across the way, like a long ways away, I see a guy with a telephoto lens looking straight at straight at us. And I started noticing around the neighborhood that everybody would have their lenses on us. And then I thought, well, if you had the traffic cams to it, that would make sense 
to where people could watch you. They leave the house. You go down the street. You go into the market. They, they're expecting you there, and they've been following too. And so they say, well, hello, uh, Zaf, or hello, uh, you know, whatever. It's something they couldn't know. And to try to scare you and then see what you'll do or to try to do something to you and see what they'll do. And if you're on total closed circuit TV, they can watch the whole thing from anywhere. They could watch it from other states or even other countries. And the people say, well, if you, yeah. if you complain about that, you're just a paranoid psychotic and you need help, you know? And then you go, well, how many of you people are in on this? And it's like pretty much the whole city, dude. You know, and then I had another person go, look, I said, well, here's what's been happening. There's been a lot of stress. She goes, you know, and, and this person goes, you know, I know what happened. I know what happened. Yeah. Okay. And then they just drop it. You know what happened? Yeah. You mean you didn't warn me? Yeah. You didn't tip me off? You didn't help me? Mm-hmm. But you want me to break bread with you, and then you say, you know what happened, before I even explain it. Like, you don't even want it spoken about. You just want to say, you know what happened. Great. So what is this? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, like the girl in the church who's crying and comes up to me and says, but you're so pretty. But. Okay. Yeah, but. Well, thank you. Well, now what? You know, finish it. Come on. And, and that was all I got, you know, with that little piece. Well, I ran to the races with that. I mean, I wondered all kinds of stuff with that. Yeah, that, that would that would that would occupy me if something like that happened to me and, you know, uh, any any similar kind of thing that would send me to uh, you know my bed, staring at the ceiling and yeah. wondering about that for days, until finally I, <laughs> I convinced myself that didn't really happen. That was you know you're just imagining, and it. it's like okay, that didn't okay. I I can go out again. I'm I'm going to go outside again. I'm it didn't really happen. It, it's. I'm going to try again. I, I just, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm messed up. I need help. You know, uh, I just heard it oh. wrong, or maybe I'm just conditioned from the past, or having PTSD. It's, it's my fault. I, 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 I'm the one that's acting up in church. I'm the one that, you know, obviously it's, it's on me. You know, it's not on them. They're, you know, they're, they're normal, and I'm not. I mean, you know, if I go around and say they're all crazy and I'm normal, then they all would start laughing at me. And and yet the very thing you know, that, is true. Yeah, it, that makes me think of when after the uh, sexual assault. Okay, and I'm 57 when this happens. I mean, I'm not wow. like you know young or uh, that. That never happened to me in my well, life. Tell us so about. I really didn't know tell what tell us the Tina. Tell us the story of that. Like you know, uh, if you, if you don't mind, uh, just uh, how did that happen to you? Uh, this person came in, and he was very tall. He was like six foot four or five, and uh, he uh, was somebody that I was, uh, you know, uh, acquainted with uh, by the handler that had come into my house and, and basically uh, uh, got everything. Um, so that guy was gone, and then this guy came, and it was like the night before Christmas Eve, and he said, I have something for you. Well, I'm like, you know, heartbroken. I don't, I, you know, I just, I'm in a very weak, weakened place. And I said, well, okay, but don't bring anything to smoke, and, you know, and we're not going to drink or anything, because that was something that I didn't want to do. I didn't need any more paranoia going on with him here. So he came by, and he gave me a hug, and I remembered it was quite a long hug, he was so tall, and um, he had his, uh, my head was like in his chest because that, you know, that's, he was so tall. And well, we're just going to talk and just, I don't know, look at my Christmas tree kind of a thing, you know, nothing. And um, then he handed me a Christmas card, and I opened it up. There could have been something in there. I still do not know how I was drugged. Um, so it was either powder on his chest or there was something in the card. I don't know. But uh, the next thing I remember is I am on all fours. Um, I'm in the bedroom on all fours, and I'm trying to get... I wake up. I wake up, and I'm in excruciating pain. Are you sure you want to hear this? Well, I no, if you're not comfortable, no, I don't have to hear the gory details. I just was, you know, the, the, the lighter things. I mean, I don't... You don't well, no, I mean, I can. I just don't, you know, want to say something and then, you know, uh, the, the, I think the that, podcast gets taken off. I think I, our, I don't name names and stuff. No, no, I, I don't. But, th- yeah, I, I, I tried to. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, okay. it, it's okay. So I try to get it. I, I'm screaming because I have to. I have to pee. Okay, and I I wake up and I can't get away. I'm trying to crawl away and I can't get away, and uh, it, I'm very in pain. And then finally, I am released. And uh, I get away, and I try to go to the bathroom, and I can't. Well, I didn't know what was going on with that until uh, a couple days later when I went to the emergency room. It was my second emergency room. Uh, The doctor said to me, sure, your cervix was being grabbed and squeezed, and it was was, um, not not pulsating. It was... uh, traumatized and it was spasming it was spasming i said oh okay you know so they found out that i had you know the, the you know cuts and stuff like that and and uh you know some diseases and things that i needed to be taken care of that was the second emergency room the first one and this is what when you were talking about and this is what made me think of this this is my point um when you said oh okay well maybe that didn't happen and maybe i just have ptsd and i should just be gentle with myself and you know that sort of a thing right because there i am i'm i'm at the emergency room i drive myself there two days later because i'm sick and i'm still spaced out and i really am just i don't even know what to do so I call my mom, and I tell her that I don't feel good, and that's where I'm going. Well, when I got there, uh, I'm holding all my house papers because I'm afraid they're going to steal my house. They're going to come in my house. They're going to take all my papers out of the filing cabinet, and they're going to somehow take my deeds and stuff, and they're going to try to get my house. So I've got all my papers with me, so I'm on the emergency table in the emergency room, and I'm there forever. Okay, there I am, you know, no clothes on, under a sheet, a paper sheet, and this doctor comes over, and he's looking at me, you know, shaved head, you know, really a, a real presence to him. He's got a real presence to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody is talking to me in there. I'm trying to get the ladies to talk to me, and nobody is talking to me in there. And um, he tells me that I was not raped. He tells me that I was not sexually assaulted, okay? And if I keep talking about that, you know, he's going to have me put away. You know, mm. what are those, what, are, what do you got over there? What are those papers that you have? Because I remember telling my mom on the phone, I had all the papers. So, you know, because I was worried the dogs were in the house, but I was worried that I took all my papers. And so he said, yeah, you've got papers there that say that you should be committed, that you should be somewhere. You know, you better stop talking like this or that's where I'm going to have you put. Do you know what? That was the worst experience out of all of them that I have been to. Even watching people down at the junkyards walk in slow motion like in, in like a different dimension. Okay, that didn't even come close to what I felt naked on this table feeling vulnerable that this dude is going to go get my, he's going to, uh, well, he said to me, those, those aren't, those papers are, are, are your mental, your, your mental papers. You're supposed to be in a mental ward. And if you keep talking like that, you know, blah, blah, blah. he said, see, I told you nothing was wrong with you. Okay. And I was there for a very long time that day. I was scared to death that they were going to put me somewhere that I wasn't going to go home to my dog. Mm-hmm. I mean, I thought, Okay, I'm not going to say anything more. Let me just get out of here. I just need to get out of here, you know. So, again, you know, it's like, do you see purple people? No, I don't see purple people. <laughs> you see purple people, you know, all the time, but you don't tell them that you see purple people. No. Otherwise, they'll lock you up. So I just right. stopped uh, stopped talking about it. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I it, that, that was the most horrifying experience, I think, in all of this, was laying there and looking at this guy, and he treated me like garbage you were raped and he told you you weren't correct okay so that's as simple as it goes he's in on it there you go why would he say that unless he was in on it he wouldn't he would just treat you as a rape victim correct but if he was in on it, he would say Correct. you weren't raped. If you keep talking, we're going to lock you up. The only reason he'd do that is because he is a classic perp along with the uh, the, the, the person that broke in and who, who knows how many other people involved. They kn- They knew you'd go the seek help. Right. They knew you'd seek help. Yes. And so they were ready yes. for you. They were ready for you. Oh, yes. They were. They kept me there for like four or five hours. 
Um, and, uh, you know, they were uh, all treated me like I was nuts. I, I, I couldn't wait to I was so sorry that I went there. And then I had to go to another one. I went to a Catholic emergency room hospital, uh, I think the next day or two, and they did find out that I had infections and cuts and you need this and that, and they gave me some pills. They were very nice to me, Um, you know, but the lady from the local sexual assault commission or whatever, she was there, and I believe that she was also linked to the bad people. Believe it or not, I do. I felt it. I, I, you know, she was in there to, like, find out what's going on. Right. You know, to have her, her mic on the phone open, you know, because she always had her cell phone in her hand. So, you know, they can listen to everything. Then if the mic on the phone is open. And, you know, you know cops can do anything, Zeph. They, get, they can get into anywhere and they can do anything. Yeah, no, I understand that. And I understand they're, the you know, police are just really the front line of a multi-tiered, multi-dimensional system of uh, Satanists. Perps are Satanists. Yes, you got it. P- uh, please understand, you it. people, that they're not just, you know, perps like they're just kind of criminals. They're Satanists, structurally, hardcore, bottom line, end of the rabbit hole, Satanists. That's what they are. They worship evil. They worship death. They worship destruction. They steal. They lie. They murder. Uh, murder, you know, by getting you to commit suicide, they murder you because they drive you to suicide and take credit for your death. And, um, you know, this is Suicide Awareness Month because Tina, Tina has deemed it Suicide Awareness. She gave me the idea of Suicide Awareness Month because of Francesca, which um, I so appreciate that, Tina. It's it's uh, it's helping me to really cope with what happened. I mean, it. It's taken a whole year to be, I can't even see it clearly till I'm beginning to see it more clearly now, but it's been, you know. And that's what we need to hear. We need to hear that because there were many of us who didn't even know you. We just had been listening to you like my mom. Yeah. You know, we cried with you that day a year ago. Oh. We were in our homes and we cried with you. It hurt. So it's, it's, it is important. You know, there is that thin line between homicide, and that'll be another time that we can talk about that. But uh, you know, the suicide thing, you know, you, yeah. we we love you, and uh, we are watching you go through this in public. It's very heroic, quite frankly. Well, I couldn't do it any other way because it was really the public, you know, access here that allowed me to, you know, give it to the Lord and then use the Lord's strength or the Lord giving me strength to go through and keep going. I'm, I know that was his will because I'm, I was just about to give up, just about to give up. You know what I mean? I'm just about to go down that road. And I felt that she had died on the 18th of July, 2018, a year ago. And then, and then I, I found out, we found out about it on the 19th. You know, it took a, it was a day lag. Because, I mean, you know, the body had to be discovered and, you know, all that. So that took about a day. So we heard about it on the 19th. Well, on the 20th was our 20 on 20 broadcast, which was coming right up in just a few hours as the day was breaking. And I'm, I remember like we're in the RV. We have an RV. We're in, in, in Durango, Colorado in an RV park and got the news there. And I was lying on the bed just shivering and I didn't... Uh, and I was telling people I couldn't do it, you know, Govinda, and I remember Kanita, Charles, and others, I, I, you know, we need, a, I don't know what to do, Patrick, I was talking to him, I, you know, and, and then and then suddenly the Lord just said, you know, I felt that we prayed, Trish and I, and, and, uh, and Govinda prayed with us, I remember, and I think Patrick prayed with us, and um, the next thing you know, I was on my feet and then over to the, I don't think I acted too well on the, on the podcast, but the show went on. We went ahead and did the 20 on 20 and, uh, at the same time, inter- intercepting calls from, uh, my, my ex wife, Ercelia, who, um, was just, um, I mean, she was, she was wishing she could commit suicide. That's where she was at. So we we're having to, minister to her to not do the same thing mm-hmm. Francesca did because she said Francesca had a lot of courage I wish I could have joined her and so that's mm-hmm. not exactly the right, right but there you go there's pain out there right and so she was wishing she had you know and and uh, we we were praying with her 
uh, to stop her from committing suicide and at the same time dealing with Francesca's suicide. And so all that support from the community and your support and others and the prayers helped kind of keep me going publicly. And I thought, well, let's just let this be a, a public testimony then. Let's just, you know, I'm not going to go hide. I just, here, here you go. I mean, this is what happens, you know? And, uh, you know, this is a, a spiritual war. And, um, but I was always aware of the, of the support from you and other people. Uh, and I, I talked about, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm being a bore. I'm talking about this so much about her death. And I was meeting other people who lost their uh, child, uh, sometimes uh, one out of a couple of children, sometimes an only child. I, I became aware of so many other people that had lost a child, many to suicide, and, 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 and they were you know following Jesus. And then, um, you know, so I thought, well, look, they're in pain and they're not squawking about this every day. And I thought, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, I, I don't want to act like the only person that never lost a child, but, you know, my God, I didn't know what it was like until I lost one. I, I didn't, I, I said, but I could, I could guess what it's like, um, when other people lose a child or an only child, but I, I just had no idea until it happened, what really you, you, know, you go through. And I believe that um, the Lord used it to uh, prove his strength, his glory, how he could use what was intended for harm and what was harm and make it for the good of people. So it, I think it became the real bright spot in the um, Zeph report. I mean, though it was tragedy, the Lord was turning it into a bright spot that helped people to, um, I don't know, it helped people in some way that uh, realized we're going to get through this and that the Lord is our strength. I think a lot of people understood that they just couldn't make it on their own after my situation because Mm -hmm. there's just no way. There's absolutely no way I could make it on my own. Not in a million years. It was because of those prayers and support from brothers, sisters, just our, our extended family out there. That's what worked. That's what worked. And in a weird way, Francesca's death is being used to heal my past traumatic experiences that I've had trouble kind of clearing or getting over, or forgiving, that Francesca's death helped me to really get accelerated on those points. To really get down, you know, without her death, I'd probably be a lot more of a hermit. I mean, with her death, it's kind of brought me out into the, into the, into view. Like, you know, well, there's nothing to fear now. It's almost like if someone survives a plane crash, you know, then he's, there's, there's a movie about that where a guy survives a plane crash. He's like dangling off buildings. He's all, you know, he used to be afraid of heights and now he doesn't care, right? Because he survived a plane crash. You survive that and you, 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 it makes you bolder. You know, in some way, it just makes you, you, you just end up with more courage, you know, and you, you go, well, look, Francesca, I'm going to bless you by, instead of like us just, you know, dealing with traumas, I'm just going to fling myself into it even more. And the Lord was right there with that and the people were there with that. And it's like, yeah, we need to, you know, uh, the only way that I could make sense out of it was to go forth and to go forward. I couldn't go back. You know, there's no more going back after that. You know, no more retreating to the, you know, to into a delusion, into a, you know, an alternate personality. <laughs> Which, you know, like uh, pers- personality A, alter A, everything's fine. <laughs> you know, uh, just need a few more, right. vo- a few more vodka tonics. And, and by God, that, what a great world, you know. No, there's no more of that. Right. That that's those days are gone. It's more like you're a singular person, no alternate personalities, no other place to go, no kind of delusion to jump in. You're going to have to go straight forward and tell the people you're dealing with, you know, I'm I got I'm trying to overcome a problem and 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 thank you for understanding, you know. If if people are civilians, they don't know what you're going through. And I said, "Well, I'm just going to tell them." Yeah, I'm just going to tell them. You know, I'm I'm, you know, uh I'm I'm not the same as you. I can't just run around the track here, but I'm going to try. Yeah. So her death uh, helped in that regard to uh, 
pay set. I'm sorry. No, we we all love you. You know, we we expect this, and you know, we 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 just we're here. That's what this is about. Yeah, it just it's coming up on a year. It's okay, you know. It's okay. It, it's uh, it's okay. I don't care. I don't care. It's, I'm, I'm gonna go through it anyway. I'm not gonna hide it or jump under the bed. And, you know, wish that things weren't the way they were. It's not about me, you know. So um, I'm just going, you know, full tilt here. I feel like I'm back twenty, thirty mm-hmm. years now. I'm back. You know, even though my body may be older, I feel completely <laughs> rejuvenated. <laughs> <laughs> and and ready to go. And I know people complain. They yeah. say they say, Zef, you know, I feel horrible and I'm under the bed and I'm under the mattress and I wish I was dead and I this and I that and I'm and I just tell them, look, I understand, but please don't blame me if I fling myself 140 miles an hour forward. Please don't get mad at me if I go 140 miles an hour right into it. I'm just gonna go right into the flames. I don't care. See, now it doesn't matter. I can do it because she's gone. There's no reason to fear anything. You see what I mean? It's like the fear is gone. I'm just going to fling myself into it. I don't care what they do. Go ahead and start in. It doesn't matter to me. You're not going to scare me. If I see them doing something in a Walmart or some kind of thing and they start in with this uh, demonic shit, I'm just going to, I'm just moving right into the middle of that crowd. I'm going to bust it up. I'm going to start laughing at these fools. I'm not going to stand down and do nothing. Okay, uh, this was supposed to be about you, Tina, not not me. I got sure I got triggered into it. Okay, okay. you know that, that was really good because see what happened by uh, and 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 what they did to me here with with the assault was I was being punished. I was being punished because I had uh, thrown the handler. Uh, I had the cops come and pick him up for coming through the doggy door and, you know, got rid of him. And so that was a big no-no what I did. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Yeah, I was being punished. Okay. But after that, and letting it go because nothing could be done, there was no justice, all of that. Okay. What happened there is when I go outside and somebody does one of those silly uh, same-time exit entrance, or I go out the back door and the lady uh, is monitored me, monitoring me up the block and uh, she uh, will call for her dog whenever I go outside through the back door. Or that, that foolishness, that nonsense stuff that they do. Yeah. You know, if I'm in Chicago shoveling, they come out and they shovel. All of a sudden, the whole block is outside shoveling. You know, it's, it's right. like, you know what? Right. You guys right. really think after what I went through at that hospital... You really think that your little same time, same time entrance and exit and you're calling the dog and all is going to break me? Are you kidding me after what I went through? So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that, Jeff. I know exactly what you're saying. It, it really does. It strengthens us as long as we don't, you know, grab the guns and get out there and try to play Rambo. No, I, mean, I know. We've really I know. got to try forward. I did write a... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's funny i have an experience i wrote a screenplay just i hadn't written in a long time i mean i read, wrote two novels and then i kind of had a hiatus for a long time doing this and and um you know just producing the show and music and different things but i mean i i wrote a it's not being produced right now this was just the first out of two but it's um it had to do with um you know you write what you know so i i was writing about a guy from the military industrial complex who's being he was in a completely fake life, fake wife, fake kids, fake everything, you know, guy next door with all the surveillance equipment, you know, beaming him, directed energy weapons, you know, just messing with this guy. It's almost like he was an experiment. And then, of course, all the uh, gas lighting type of stuff that you guys are all familiar with, you know, the the you know what I mean, all the, the stuff that the insiders know, you know, the grumbling, the, the, the clearing the throat, the whistling, you know, the foot tapping, the, all that sort of thing. I had all that in there, you know, and and there was a guy that was um, wanting to direct it. I don't know if he was really, um, if he was for real. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know he's for real. I mean, he wanted to direct it. He's just directed a feature film. And I, I, and I, so I was like, uh, then he told me, you know, that he doesn't believe in this, this, this whole gang stalking thing. And that anyone that believes it is crazy, he said. 
I said, well, why do you want to direct mm-hmm. the, why, see what I mean? He's already coming in as a handler. So why do you want to direct it then? If you don't, if you believe that I'm completely nuts, then why would you even want to direct this? And he's like, well, I have notes to change it. He said, you can't, oh. you can't have this guy killing all these people that makes him look like a psychotic killer. I said, these are perpetrators. They're trying to ruin his life. And uh, he, he's, he is Rambo. <laughs> this guy is a military, you know, top Navy, uh, whatever, you know, plus, uh, you know, it also had the devil and all, all kinds of things going, but he was shooting him down. I mean, we had a body count like you can't believe. And I just loved it. <laughs> the thing is, and he just goes, this, this makes you look like a, a, a psychotic murderer. I said, he's justified. He goes, he is not justified in killing all these people. I said, yes, he is. It's a movie, mm-hmm. you know? And it's sure. And I, I asked people on the show, I said, would you like to see this, this thing that's got you so freaked out? And wouldn't you like to see the shoe on the other foot for once? Now, I don't recommend killing anybody. I'm a man of peace, a man of love, man of God, you know, not, but, uh, I'm, I'm not against writing out, you know, what's your, what's your, you know, stories, you know, that may involve things like that. Uh, anyway, the guy went crazy. He was like, you know, he came, he had like, he had like 50 pages of notes. I said, well, then why doesn't he just write his own screenplay and hell with mine? I mean, you know, obviously he wants to turn this whole thing into something and isn't. Why would that be? Could it be to stop this from going into production? Does he want to have, does he feel a responsibility to stop the actual story? So he's acting like he's all for it, but he's changing. I mean, I got those feelings. I can't prove it. But, you know, uh, the, the project's not dead. I mean, it, it could be produced, but I realize the danger in producing it now more. You know, I realize that I don't know if they would allow it. You know what I mean? I just, maybe that's just too much. That's like, maybe that's sort of like, you know, uh, taking the red cape away from the bull and letting the bull just run me over. Maybe that, maybe that's, you know, tempting the Lord too much, if you know what I mean. I, you know, like, pro- well, I've always heard. Go ahead. I've always heard that very seldom do they have the director and the writer on the set at the same time because of these conflicts. Is that true? I, I heard that. It might not be true. But well, I heard it that depends. They don't have the right. Well, if the writer is a, you know, uh-huh. I mean, it's the director takes it and has to turn it into his vision and needs to have the support of the writer. If the writer is um contentious with the director then he could be banned from the set that happened it's not wouldn't be the first time but i've never been really like that i'm all about you know if i'm not going to direct it i'm all about you know trying to i'm i'm a kind of a like you i was more of a team player i was always sought after on screenplays to rewrite them and redo the dialogue and do stuff you know because i was always uh directors really love me love working with me you know what i mean and i'm and I tell them, I don't want to do, I'm not trying to do your job. I don't want, I've done your job. I tried it out and I don't think it's for me. So I'm, I'm not someone that harbors a, you know, that's writing so that one day I can direct. I would never had, you know, I, I did my, my turn at that. I didn't really work out so well for me. And I didn't, it's, I'm, I'm more of a writer and a producer, a producer in a sense that, uh, you know, um, you know, getting the thing going and, 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 you know, backing the director. <laughs> making sure that, uh, you know, the director has as much ammo as he can going into this battle because, to me, all these these little feature films, especially independent films, are so difficult to do. It's like getting out on the high seas in a boat that's not a big, giant yacht. You know, you don't have all the luxuries, and the crew really has to pull together, and the, everybody has to pull together to actually accomplish it without, you know, so it will be a competitor in the world stage, not just a forgotten, you know, project. And if anyone has an attitude like, like a gang stalking attitude or a bad attitude or, you know, feels like they're going to scuttle it or, you know, wants to sabotage it or cause a mutiny of the crew against the director or the producer, anything like that, uh, these independent projects are so much on a little shoestring to begin with. They, it could sink the, it could sink the, the project, which is why, you know, which is why it's always a miracle. It's, it's always good if people pray, actually, if you, trying to do one of these films that's independent and and you know film is a very good uh i still believe in it as a very positive medium that can you know for all kinds of reasons i mean one would be entertainment one would be like 
something like the unplanned movie bringing up the other side of abortion. I think it's all, you know, although I do not believe that storytelling should be about propaganda at all. I'm, I'm anti-propaganda. So, you know, I'm more like, let the story go where it wants. And if it offends people, even your own people, fine. You know what I mean? Just let it be more honest and not, and, and not pull punches. But that's just my philosophy. I, you know, I mean, <laughs> I've can't believe some of the reactions I've gotten. And we did one, uh, one another screenplay that just misfired because it offended people. Was we did one about pedophiles, and then a vigilante group blowing away the pedophiles who happen to be the elites of society, who are getting children pumped in to their parties from orphanages. At the time, we had no idea how close we were back in 1998. We were just guessing. Wow. I mean, we didn't, now it's all over the news. <laughs> but we, you know, and, and people just laughed at us when they'd read the script, they read 20 pages of the script, they start laughing, you know. And, but I, I still think it was a cool idea and, and it was producer Mike was my collaborator on it. And I don't know, Tina, you know, it's, um, we do what we know we can do. And, you know, if, if, there, if there can be any, any awareness brought to this issue through film, which I'm hoping I'm, I haven't given up on that. It's just that I ran into, uh, I ran into a little bit of a brick wall with the people that were, they seem more interested in changing the story than actually dealing with, you know, and also bringing my character into, uh, into question. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not going to do this with you. I'm the producer. I'm not going to produce you doing this and then butchering my you know and and everybody else out there that's gone through this reality i had some classics too guy goes into a pizza place you know and they're waiting for him in there and there's a couple of like thug type guys harassing him like they they know he's under siege like the rate he turns the radio on when he gets back in the car the radio starts mocking him the guy in the radio is talking to him (laughs) And, and these are all based on real incidents that that people may not believe but they do happen anyway and enough about me i just want to uh get back to um you tina and like a couple more questions just about the future um how do you feel now going i mean i, I think you've answered this in a way but i mean any any plans for another book or and we're going to get some more books folks and get those books out there as well but any plans for another book or continued writing i i hope <laughs> Well, I know that you suggested that to me, and I had told you at that time that if I did write another book, I've got to try to find a way to publish it where it isn't, uh, you know, isn't like a, a twenty-five, thirty-dollar book. You know, I'd like right. to uh, somehow make it a little bit reasonable for targeted individuals who really many of them don't have the money, and that's why I read it on YouTube, and and uh, of course you are mm-hmm. distributing them and I want to do more. mailing them out. You know, those mailing. Some of those mailings are more than the book is. It's amazing, and I really want to thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, what you did was just awesome. Well, we're going to do more, uh, too. So I, I, uh, I'm not sure about another book. Maybe it, it won't be. This one helped me. This one I had to selfishly, you know, put a bunch of credits down under the about the author, and I had to remember who I was and what I had accomplished in my life. I needed to get that out there, and so I didn't do it for attention. I did it for a self healing. Uh, but the writings in it are are you know, boy, that, that was those writings, those writings in that book, and the affirmations and the scriptures. To this day, if I open the book, it, it helps me. It, it helps me, mm-hmm. and so me I not, am not really sure what my next step is. I feel, um, you know, I don't know why, but I need to talk about, you know, I'm glad that you and I have gone through these things and that we've shared with these people some tough times. Um, of course, I plead the blood of Jesus over over us so that we're Amen. safe out here today. You know, after, yes. I didn't mention names and I didn't mention locations or anything, so that's just the truth. And, you know, my message in that is that we don't self-destruct behind stuff like this. Yes. You know, I wish that they would just 
I wish they would just have come and have coffee with me and tell me we don't like you. This is what, blah, 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 and tell, but they don't. Everything is a secret. Everything is planned behind the scenes. Yeah. They don't like something that I do. They punish me hard, you know. And it's like you know, you, you, it's 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 a tough thing. But we don't self destruct. Just like you, you went and you wrote a couple of screenplays. You know, it's like yeah, you know, we've got to find ways to not self destruct. You know, it's strange, though, mm-hmm. in these last, you know, we went a long time, like a long time. And then all of a sudden I was writing again after many, you know, like 15 years or, you know, I wrote two novels in 2002 and maybe 2003. And then there was nothing until now. When I got back into the writing oh. writing chair, things were, it was harder in a way, you know, but the writing was a lot sharper now, having gone through all this. It was very sharp. Wow. And, uh, and people liked it and, you know, they, they, uh, they, they, the actors liked it and people liked the, the sharpness. And I, I'm like, well, had there not been the experience, there wouldn't be the sharpness. So now I have a gratitude thing going, well, thank you, Lord. You know, that, all those experiences, you know, actually sharpened like sharpening iron. It sharpened me to the, the, the human condition to being able to write about humans. Uh, and, and I love you know, I mean, even when I have a villain, you know, I love them. I, 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 I don't hate people. I don't hate the perps either. You know, I just feel that a lot of them are ignorant, you know, and through their ignorance, a lot exactly. of... Exactly. I feel the same Go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, I feel the same way. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't hate them either. You know, some, some of these people at, at one time, uh, when I first uh, uh, got here, laughed with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I actually, you know, laughed with... And, and, you know, broke bread with them and things. So, yeah, but, me too. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, don't hate them. I just, uh, you know, just actually I'm sort of indifferent. I, not indifferent. I just don't want, I just leave me alone. <laughs> right. Know? Right. Just leave me alone. But with, with me, it's like, you know, in, 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 um, I think when you write about this stuff and you write about humanity or you read the Bible, if you're a reader, reading is good. Remember reading, <laughs> folks? Um, you, you know, you start to feel a connection with humanity and some people choose the dark side, you know, a lot of people do. And then, and then other people are just, they're defaulted to the, the side of light and they may not know it and they may get all beaten up. I, I remember there's this movie called the caveman's Valentine. I don't know if you remember it had Samuel Jackson in it and it, uh, yes, the Samuel Jackson, right. And he was a cave. He lived right. in a cave I and. Saw- in the park in New York, and he had a cave there, and yep. his family was all functional, but he wasn't. He was homeless in the cave, and he was getting messages from the, you know, he was getting, you know, the, okay, this guy seemed like the classic gang-stalking lamb victim sort of you know, guy. But the scene that just blew my mind was when they're trying to bring him in as some sort of class because he was a guy that went to Juilliard, but he didn't graduate. You know, something happened on the way to graduation. And I yeah. know so many people, they didn't graduate because some, somebody threw a wrench in right at that point uh, to stop them. And so here he was in a bar, you know, typical lamb kind of guy. And he's the guy drunker than everybody else, but they, he's being looked at as the, as the problem. And it was just like one of those scenes that it just rang so true to me. And I was wondering, you know, well, these people obviously know what they're talking about. I mean, they painted a very sympathetic figure with this guy. But in the end, I think the end conclusion was, well, he's crazy. Dad's crazy. So dad is out in the park, a homeless guy. He's got every opportunity to come in, though, but he wants to stay out there. And I think they, right. got, I think they got that right, too. Uh, it yes, was a, I, I do. You remember that movie? Um I, I remember it, and, and I recall some of those scenes. And you know, earlier we were talking about the homeless people not wanting to come in. They'll they'll come in for uh, you know some soup and a sandwich, yeah. but they don't want anybody you know putting their thumb on them, basically. And I right. think that they got that right in that. They yes. did. They had that right, and they had the, it would right. The guy was being harassed, electronic harassment, and um, they were definitely messing with him. You know, and they definitely messed with him. Uh, they go, why didn't you graduate Juilliard? It's because, because he was messed with on the way to graduation. It's not his fault. You know, it's not like, oh, he, he balked. Well, okay. He balked at something. Maybe he, they wanted him to go through a satanic initiation 
in order to graduate. So he balked at that. And and for so he's forever punished for that. That's fair, right? <laughs> So, you know, but whatever the reason was, I mean, it was like, gosh, there was a, a, l- a little movie that was kind of a gift to the to the lambs in a way, you know, to people that feel, and what are lambs? Lambs are set apart ones who are just there for the Lord. That's, their lives will make no sense until they finally acknowledge Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the, you know, the way, a way, the way. And when they get that, then they realize, oh, thank you, I'm, I'm just a lamb under, it's about Jesus. And they get a line that way, and then their life makes sense. But not until that happens. Yeah, that's, that's so beautifully said, and, and, and that's it. You know, there was a huge healing the very first time I talked to you. I was in Chicago uh, in my mother's kitchen, mm-hmm. and we were talking, and we were talking about my bodybuilding career, and I said to you, and I've never told anybody this because I was very, I was a very big fish in a small pond, um, and nobody probably knew this about me, but I had said to you, well, you know, interestingly enough, I always had, like, low self-esteem. And you just piped right up and said, that's because you're a lamb. Yeah. And I was just floored by that. And you know that I have really grown from that? There was wow. a healing that was based on my heart when you wow. said that to me. It, it just made everything where I understood it. It makes sense. And you know. what you just said, too, is that we're lambs, and, you know, it's not until we find Jesus and we know, you know, know what's kind of going on and everything, uh, do we settle into that then. Before that, we don't know what's happening. We think we're we're just weird. It's almost like, yeah, we're being picked on for no reason. But, you, you know, you, 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 you can't say anything because... People think you're crazy, and then it's just the whole thing is a nightmare, and then all of a sudden it makes sense. And everybody I know that finally realizes, oh, God, you made me for you. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then it's all right. It's all right. And I don't know anyone who gets that revelation who wants to go back. Do you? I don't know. Not even one person. I don't know even one person that wants to go back to the way things were when they were even good in the past, which just means that person was unaware uh, I don't know anyone who wants to go back. Once they have that revelation of who they really are, they're really, it's like the ugly duckling. They're really a swan, not a duck, but a beautiful swan. Yeah. Yeah. And when they get that, they're like, yeah. wow, okay. And they never turn back. They, I guarantee you, they just don't turn back. And, you know, that's what Jesus said. He said, like, anybody that, that puts their shoulder to the plow and then turns back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Well, the yeah. pe- people I know, no matter what, they'll never turn back. They they don't even think about it. It's not even an issue. There is no, I mean, just the idea of thinking about what back would mean. It, 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 it's so convoluted. It, people couldn't really even follow that train of thought. You know, it, it, only forward, you know, with Jesus and it's about him and it, it's it's about us in him. You know, it's not not about us, but it's about us and he takes care of us and he guides us and he's the the power of the the in, of the entire universe the creator of all things that's a good side to be on you know and, yes. and I mean, yes. come on i'm not i'm not trading that in for any I, when when i i mean i was late to the party i guarantee you that i was late i was rebellious i was going to do things my own way and then i finally just laid down you know what i mean but i never looked back since that day and thank god i didn't i mean i had I felt bad a lot of the time, but I ne- but I, things kept getting a little bit better, a little bit better. It took a lot of time, a lot of years, but it it it, it gets clearer and it gets more peaceful. And and what I'm hoping is that we all end up with a break yes. a breakthrough, a loving breakthrough, where we can be really a light, especially to those who are lost out there, who may be perps today, but brethren tomorrow. Remember that. I mean, we can't for- forget that we're we're not here to be isolated and to put them over there. A lot of them are just prodigal sons and daughters. They don't even know. They're, they're just doing, you know, yeah. monkey see, monkey do. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. You know, they they just learn that that works and, you know, and, and eventually th- th- some of them step up. And when they step up, we are to embrace them as as long lost brethren. We you have Christmas dinner with them, whatever. I mean, we're not, remember Sabina Wormbrand, that story I keep telling, where she, uh, 
the the wife of famous pastor Richard Wormbrand, and you know the, the 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 communists killed her whole family, and there was a guard that was involved in actually killing her family. He became a brother in Christ, and they all had Christmas dinner together as family. That whole thing, whatever kill, yeah. killing her family, was forgotten. There was no bad blood there at all. Just pure love. Wasn't he locked up and she visited him? Was, was that the story? She went and visited him, uh, and he was locked up? Well, he was locked up, and she would she, visit he, Yeah, she would wait and visit him. He was locked up, and he was even locked up when Billy Graham I, went, I, went to Romania and did a, a talk about how great it is that Romania is a Christian country, liberated from the communists. Okay. While Richard Wormbrand was locked up several floors below, <laughs> he's giving he's giving the ugly American speech. Thank God, you know the political speech of thank God Christianity is winning here in Romania. <laughs> it was just such a joke, but you know that's the world we live in. So, anyway, Tina, look, I really appreciate you being here. Any any last thoughts for the our friends out there? Any last uh, encouraging words or thoughts or anything that occurs? Well, the thing, uh, you were a little muffled the last five minutes, though. I was trying to, really straining to hear you, but I, I know you said something about, um, you know, uh, we might have Christmas dinner with our perps or something like that. You know, the thing that I learned is, you know, okay, you know, we can pray for them, or, or even just not hating them right. is a big relief to us, just not having the hate in our heart for them. I don't really pray much for mine. Uh, I have my days, but I, I, you know, it's not something I got to grow in that area. Okay. Uh, but I'm not uh, hiding in the bushes with, uh, you know, uh, a shotgun either. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I, I Amen. don't have hate in my heart. Yeah. And we don't want to have that hate, but we also don't want to set ourselves up. We're going to go over there and have coffee with them, you know? Right, so right. We don't want to set ourselves up. Either. Right, right. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord. I mean,. You're not going to tempt God by going and playing on the freeway either. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I understand. Because I got confused. You know, because Jesus used to have, you know, he used to hang out with the sinners, you know, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and, you know, the thieves. And I remember telling somebody that, yeah, but Jesus. And the person looked at me and said, yeah, but that was Jesus. And I was like, yeah, that's true. I don't need to be like Jesus that way. I mean, I just don't want to have hate in my heart. When I have hate in my heart, I start to uh, have problems with my body. It's something that's too heavy for me to carry. And my heart was not made to uh, endure all the hate that I certainly could have by the stories that I shared today, and those were just a couple. Yeah, my body can't take that. It, it breaks down. And so that was just my last thought, that, you know, we don't want to stare into our past, but we don't want to forget who we are either, you know? Well, God gave everybody talents, too, and, you know, expects, expects us to try to go forth with those. Tina, it's been so much fun to talk to you today, and sorry about the garbled phone. I'm trying to talk at the microphone right now. I see the mic is on this side. Of the, I see. What if I had this like this direction here? How's that sound? Well, you know, I'm not sure. I, I want to apologize if I was talking over you. That's it, okay. It was, uh, you know, like we have that delay on the phone over here. So, right, right. Um, yeah, I don't know how that sounds right now. You'll have to talk. Okay. Uh, <laughs> t- test but, Testing one, two, three. How's that? What are your last thoughts? My last thought is I'm just, what are your last? I thank you for really for being here today and helping me to understand more and, and, and helping me to, you know, get, a, I, I think, a few more steps with Francesca's death because of bringing up that idea of, of being, you know, it's Tina's idea to have Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month. And this is that, even though we, we may not do every podcast about that, it's still to keep it in mind, you know, and. And uh, I think I think a lot. We're learning a lot, you know. And I think you helped to bring that topic to bear. And I just thank you for you know not um, you know for being kind to me during that that period because some people were not kind. And you know, that's, um, I, I think when things like that happen, sometimes you, you get blamed, like you know somehow your fault or you know. And I I don't accept that. But I mean, you know, you were really kind to me ab- about that and and uh, helped me to get through that that um i go don't know if it's getting through but help me to 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 cope with that 
hardcore reality. It's just, um, that's, and I thank you for that, Tina. Thank you. God bless you. Well, oh, you know, you're so welcome. My goodness. I was scared to ask you. That's why I said to you, I don't hope I'm not crossing boundaries here, but just a thought. And then you went for it, and it was like, wow. So, you know, we help each other. We, we really do. Today was good for me. You know, the first time I spoke with you on the show, um, I, uh, you know, I, I was walking around my mother's house wringing my hands for weeks, wow. trying to come up with every excuse possible because of the PTSD and everything. Today was really healing. Yes. Um, I, I pray that uh, we are safe, that we have the blanket of God's protection over us, and anybody that heard the stories, uh, you know, aren't traumatized or anything, and I just uh, right. I just pray that, uh, like you said, Tina, don't you know, you wrote me an email, you said, Tina, don't worry, God's got this. He's got this, and Amen. he's going to make this great. And I was like, oh, yeah. You know, sometimes we forget that, and it's like, oh, okay, cool. God's got this. I don't have to worry. He's got our battles. Oh, how wonderful. His burden is light, his yoke is easy, and he's got the battle. And thank God for that, because, whoa, it's way over my pay grade. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for being. Exactly. Please, please stay right there, folks. Uh, that that's uh, it for today. The show. It was always a blessing to have Tina here, and we we'll hope to have her back very soon. And we're going to get some more books in and give some more books away, and encourage you guys to maybe there's a way to get your book on Kindle or something, uh, Tina, where it can be on a um, you know you can download it to your computer or something and read it read it there for for those who have- I think uh, it's on Kindle. I think it's on Kindle. Okay. I believe it is. That's an ebook, isn't it? Yeah. Well, those are and, not. And I don't want to forget Trish. You know, Trish is was Where's Francesca's uh, stepdaughter, right? I mean, Francesca was Trish's yes. stepdaughter. Ab- absolutely. And yeah. Fran- well, you know, I don't want to forget Trish either. You know, our prayers go out to Trish as well. Yeah, yeah. She's um, everybody loves. Trish. Yeah, Trish. Trish really, um, you know, uh, has been in grief as much as me. And Trish accepted Francesca sure. as if she were uh, Trish's own daughter. And it was, you know, and, and everyone, you know, everybody loved her. And that was just the, you know, that's what makes it so uh, crazy. You know, just, it, you know, and uh, her uncle, I told you about her uncle, Tino, and he he yeah. loved her as a daughter. So he had, she had like two fathers, two mothers, everybody in the community. I mean, you know, she was a beloved person. But troubled, mm-hmm. very troubled. Okay, well, all right, folks, we're going to go. Okay. God bless you each and yeah. everyone. Tina, stay right there. Don't move. I'm going to just put my okay. music on and wrap the show, and then I'm going to talk to you uh, off the air here. All right, everybody, okay. have, a, have, a great, right. have a great uh, week. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.